Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am Catherine Stimson, and I wish to welcome you to this session of the Skirball Tapes with an extraordinary guest, Anne Bogart. No one better to explore the themes of radical imagination, radical creativity, and indelible acts that emerge from them than Anne Bogart. She's the author or co-author of six books. She's the co-founder of an important theater company, the CT Company. She's the director of scores of plays and operas from Verity to a contemporary opera based on The Handmaid's Tale. Quite frankly, Anne, I gave up counting. I gave up counting how many. She's invented a teachable vocabulary of the theater and teaches directing classes. So Anne, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. And I just want to remind our audience that put your questions in the Q&A and I'm sure you'll have some. Anne and I will talk. We'll take questions oh, a few minutes before we have to break at noon, but we're in for an adventure an adventure of the mind and imagination about the theater. And I want to start with two questions for Anne. Tomorrow night, Thursday, May 11th, <clears throat> I am going to pick up my mask and I am going to walk down 4th Street in New York City to La Mama Experimental Theater. And I'm going to see a production of a musical called the Beautiful Lady, a musical by Elizabeth Suedos, Suedos, who died in 2016. And Anne, she was your almost exact contemporary. You were born in the same year of 1951. And the librettist, Paul Schmidt, who died in 1999. So here are my two questions. They're linked questions. So can I just put them on the table? <laughs> Please, could I do that? What shall I expect? You surprise your audience. I have never been to one of your productions where I haven't been surprised. <laughs> so you had choices. What choices did you make about accepting this play, this musical? And what are you going to do? To, what are your surprises? And the second question, what do you expect of me? Not Catherine Stimson of me as an audience member. Huh. You have written both tenderly and provocatively about the role of the audience. And in effect, you've said no theater without an audience. Huh. Am I right about this? So what shall I expect? And what do you as the director and what do the actors expect of me sitting in a chair on East 4th Street in New York City. And insightful, thank you again for being here. Insightful questions, Catherine, as usual. And I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be in this virtual room with you. The only thing better is to be in a real room with you. And, you know, I will saying, make that happen. Yeah, well, anybody who's listening, um, Catherine Stimson is one of the best dinner guest parties there is. You know, if you ever want to, you say, like, I want to plan a dinner party, invite all my favorite people, like, what would create the best evening? I would definitely invite Catherine to my uh, dream party, because she's, um, she asks those kind of questions, uh, and she participates with her brain in a way that always makes the evening better. So for that reason, I'm really delighted to join brains with you today, Catherine. And um, thank you for and thank you for that invitation to come. <laughs> yeah. So so yes, Liz Suedos is my exact contemporary and somebody I envied so much. I knew her personally when I was in my early 20s. I met her the first time I ever saw her was when I was in, in undergraduate college and and we started a theater company that was um based on the the, the book uh, Towards a Poor Theater by Grotowski. So we were all Grotowskiites at the time. I mean, it was of the time really. And um, we used to come drive down to New York. It was a two hour trip from Bard College. We drive down to New York to see productions. And I remember that Peter Brook had just come back from um, 
Africa with his company. And we went to, to participate in a workshop and see a production of the Conference of the Birds at BAM in now what's the cafe, which was once the Leperc space. And at this workshop, there were about 200 people participating in this workshop. We basically watched these exotic actors from around the world. I was so jealous of everybody then. And um, this young kid by age, I mean, I guess I was 20 then, she was 20 then, walked out and essentially conducted the audience in a bird call set, the audience, the participants, in a, a series of bird calls that was so amazing. And then I, wa I watched her work over the years, going, uh, do her work, of course, with Andre Sherban and the, you know, the infamous trilogy, the, the, the Trojan women is still in ancient languages is still touring after what, 50 years or something. I'm, I'm talking, in the late 70s is when I saw that work, to her own works of um, uh, Nightclub Cantata and uh, Runaways on Broadway. A phenomenal talent, a unique talent. And I always, as I say, her career was like a rocket taking off. And what I felt in relation to her, my contemporary was like, dum ti dum ti dum ti dum That was my career. It was like, dum ti dum ti dum While she just took off. And I was so jealous and admiring of her. Before she died, we were never terribly close, but I admired her. But before she died, we did get a little bit close. And, and I begged her that we could work together and do another version of nightclub cantata, which meant, she understood what that meant, is that we would choose poetry that she would set to music. It never happened because we lost her, tragically. Um, but then uh, uh, Mia Yu at La Mama, which is where, was really Liz's home over those years, the good years, the tough years. Um, Mia Yu, who's a delightful human being and who is the uh, successor to Ellen Stewart at La Mama, she called me and said, you know, there's this musical called The Beautiful Lady, which Liz wrote uh, along with Paul Schmidt in 1985. And <clears throat> it's never come to New York. Would you be interested in directing it? Well, I had, before I even heard the music, I said, well, I would be to honor Liz, to celebrate her and to, but then I, then, Kate, I listened to the music and I was absolutely blown away. I have never heard such gorgeous, it was the best music she's ever written. And I love her music. And I hadn't heard those songs. You look like you're about to ask something, Catherine. Um, so, 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 Anne, this is the first New York production of The Beautiful Lady? It was done by NYU students in 1995. Oh. Um, I, in, I was so thrilled to be able to jump on board. What has saved this production are a couple of things. Uh, one is that somebody who had been a student of Liz's at NYU, Chris Kukul, who's a music director, really understands her music and has written arrangements that are phenomenal through the roof. Um, and the other thing is, the poetry was spectacular because it's Paul Schmidt's translations of these famous uh, Russian poets uh, from the early part of the 20th century who used to gather in a, 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 a basement club called the, the Stray Dog in St. Petersburg. And these poets were like rock stars. We don't consider poets like rock stars, but these were the Mick Jaggers of the era. And they were people like Anna Akhmatova, Marina Tsvetaeva, Asap Mandelstam, Mayakovsky, uh, Bloch, I mean, I could go on, the, 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 the Yesenin, these great poets, each was a different kind of rock star. And into this club, around starting around 1912, um, uh, would come um, people who just wanted to watch them get up and read their poetry or get up and sing or get up and do whatever they would do. And they would pay good money. And the, the poets would call these audience members, I'm gonna to get to your question about what to expect, would call these audience members pharmacists. There was the pharmacists and the poets. The pharmacists paid money <coughs> to see the poets espoused to live. It was like a living room in a sense. So Liz and Paul wrote this piece together. 
I believe that the reason it never came to New York is because the book at the time was a little obscure. Here were these fantastic po uh, poet poets reciting and wonderful actors reciting this poetry, singing this glorious music. And you watch as this group of poets suddenly were standing up for the Russian Revolution and then were massacred by the Russian Revolution, were massacred by uh, certainly Lenin and much more brutally than Stalin. The problem with the, the, the musical before is that in a way the audience, this is my imagination, this is what I think happened. The, the audience experienced it, but they didn't have any idea who anybody was. It was just like, yeah, these interesting people, these amazing music, but it didn't really have a book that stood up, that really took the audience on a journey. And so I called my dear friend and collaborator, Jocelyn Clark, who's a wonderful Irish uh, dramaturg and writer who I've worked with a hundred times on different city company productions. And I said, would you consider looking at this work and creating a book that makes sense? And this was my other savior. When I said I was saved by a number of things, one was the fact that Chris Kukul, who I think is the best music director I've ever worked with, uh, jumped on board and had these extraordinary arrangements. And then along came Jocelyn Clark. It's a guy, Jocelyn guy. And he, um, he worked on a book that actually lets you know who each poet is, shows you how they experienced the Russian Revolution and how they were essentially ultimately stripped of their artistic pre uh, entity through the, uh, the totalitarian place of the revolution that you're going to experience. One thing I do know is that since COVID, we don't really know how to be in the theater anymore. I think that actors have lost their nerve in terms of what it is to perform with an audience present. This play, and this is led by Jocelyn's inspiration, will help you, Catherine, when you come on Thursday to participate. I don't mean literally get up on the stage and participate, but this, I would say, this production uh, opens the door to the question of what's the audience's job? How did they co-dream the production? And this production is very, very aware of the audience. And it, my dream is that when you leave the theater, you want your own stray dog that's the name of the club, that you would say, I cannot live without finding a stray dog of my own, where I can go and live and find the dog that lives inside of me that can howl, that, um, that celebrates the extraordinary potential of poetry, which we don't necessarily, um, uh, we don't necessarily understand in this country. So- I, um, Thank yeah. you. So I am- active co-dreamer. I am to respond at the moment, uh, but I'm also to have the awful consciousness that a totalitarian state would wipe this away, would literally kill many of these people, assassinate and murder many of these people, and that we know them because art lives on. That's exactly, exactly right. And I would add one thing is that we need to understand that the kind of totalitarianism that is either governmental or, or technological will also kill us if we're not careful. I want to get to that. I really do because you have these strong and to me very persuasive theories about the theater as the place of presence and of being there. And I also want to thank you because I know you've got a cold. <laughs> I know you've got a bad cold and you still are doing this interview with me. And, and I know it's hard in your throat. So thank you very much. But your brain is without any viruses whatsoever. <laughs> so well, thank, thank you, you so much for that. But I have to say that, that doing this interview with you is actually curative. It's good, it's, it's healthy. Otherwise, I just sit around and complain about how bad I feel. Okay. I, I it's what we call in the theater, Dr. Footlights. 
<laughs> well, let me, as your pharmacist, as your pharmacist, offering you conversation instead of yeah. throat lozenges. Exactly. You back, if you will. I want to know, and I think our audience would like to know, how Anne Bogart became Anne Bogart. You had, and it still surprises me, a military family. Your father was a naval officer. Your maternal grandfather was a famous admiral who ran the Pacific Fleet during the Second World War. And you were treated, were you not, as you were not to be a naval officer, you were to be the wife of a naval officer. And I have this awful vision in my mind of your family vacations. So would you, because would you talk about those family vacations a little, because sure then will. I want to ask you how you got away yeah. by discovering the theater. So these family vacations, you, your father put the five of you into a boat and just took you out and dropped anchor? Uh, sometimes didn't drop anchor. Yeah, we dropped anchor at night. Uh, or sometimes it was too deep to drop anchor and, and then you just drift. No, it's absolutely right. So all of my my aunts were all um, uh, naval wives. My mother was a naval wife and all of their friends were naval. All the women I knew in my life were naval wives. And that was what was expected of me. I had two brothers who were expected to join the military as had done. You know, my family is so military that my great, 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 great grandfather was captain of the Minutemen. And his musket apparently is in the museum in Lexington. I mean, that's how military my family is. And so, and, and proud military and good military, not stupid military, I have to say. Um, but yes, my father, my father's um, goal in life was to be the captain of a, a aircraft carrier. And he went through being captain of various, you know, destroyers and oilers. And he finally got... Um, uh, an aircraft carrier called the Essex, which has 2,000 men on it, and he was the captain. Anyway, but his idea of a good time was to come back from being at sea and to put the family, as you say, into a boat, into a sailboat, important to know, not a motor, I mean, a sailboat with a motor, obviously, but, and to go until you couldn't see land and stay there until he had to go back to work. And the problem was, I was always miserable I don't know if I really got seasick, but I said I did all the time so that I could get out of going on these trips, but I had to go on them. My brothers were given jobs. My father taught them to sail and to fix the motor and to do this. My mother was the cook in the galley. I had nothing to do. So I would sit, I remember, because I read a lot and I would bring books with me and I would sit on the bowsprit, which sort of spreads out in front of the boat and read Ayn Rand novels and think, my family's communist, I hate them. You know, we <laughs> are too, too close to each other. It's all too close, I hate it. I hated boats. To this day, I do not want to go on a boat. I mean, the idea of going on a boat for a vacation is hell, that is the idea of hell for me. So <clears throat> yes, I did want to escape. I escaped um, through finding theater. I mean, I escaped through uh, my obsession with horses, which is like a cliche for a young girl, and then my obsession with theater, and I had to choose between the two, because um, I spent a lot of my my young years, uh, we never had a horse, but I worked in uh, stables and taught riding when I was much too young, and trained two-year-old horses. There's some relationship between training horses and training actors, I'm not going into that, but, um, uh, but then in high school, I start because we moved every year. We, we would I would find myself in some huge high school where you can't get to know everybody, and you also know you're going to move in a year or two, and so you don't want to get too close. And I found that there was a place in every school where they did these things called plays, and I was never interested in acting, although I had to a couple of times against my will. But I loved, you know, running around looking for props during classes or being backstage, lifting the curtain, helping the director, the teacher out. And then this, this sort of fairy tale um, all about Eve story happened. I had a French teacher whose name was Jill Warren, who was the first, I was in an awful high school called Middletown High School in Middletown, Rhode Island. I mean, the worst. I'm not exaggerating, just go look at it. You can tell from the side of the building. Um, 
Uh, and, 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 but I had one teacher who actually challenged us and it was Jill Warren, our French teacher. And she decided, you know, I was used to doing things, uh, uh, productions like Charlie's Aunt or Brigadoon, you know, those kind of plays. And she decided in 1967 to do The Bald Soprano by Eugene Ionesco from the absurdist tradition, which was, you know, an anathema at that time to do at Middletown High School. So of course I went on as her assistant, I would help her with anything. And the all about Eve story is that she called me <coughs> one day and she said, Anne, I have the flu and I, I you have to take over. You're and 17. I, I took over, I was 15 years old and I took over as the director and all the right things happened. We used to make theater in the schools in what was called the cafetorium which means the theater always smelled like lunch. It was the lunchroom. And at one end of the lunchroom would be a stage with a flag and a, a curtain. And up would come the curtain, there was a little stage. And that's where we did our theater. That's where we did our Brigadoon and our Charlie's Aunt and all those productions. And suddenly I had to understand this, this uh, absurdist play uh, by Ionesco, you know, a Romanian writing in French, although we did it in English. And all the right things happened. A, the guy who was playing Mr. Smith, he and I had a little fling. We sort of chased after each other. So love was involved. B, it was a huge success. I mean, in that cafetorium, people loved it. So I suddenly had the courage to think I could do this thing at 15. And I totally decided uh, I, it was between that and one other event, which also happened when I was 15, that I decided I was going to be a director. The other event was that in Providence, Rhode Island, meanwhile, when I was 15, um, Adrian Hall had taken over Trinity Rep. And he had gone to, the, to Washington as the NEA was founded and demanded a million dollars, which now is like a hundred million dollars to bring every school kid from Rhode Island in to see his theater and his company. And I was one of the school kids who drove in on a yellow school bus and saw the first professional production when I was 15, which was um, Macbeth, the Scottish play. And it blew my mind. I, 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 didn't, I learned a huge lesson because you know it was Adrian Hall, great director, great company. And with that million dollars, he could have done any kind of kid's schlock, but he didn't. He, he did um, this full bloody complicated production of Macbeth. And because the, the designer was Eugene Lee, the, 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 the witches were coming out of the ceiling. The actors were 360 degrees around this 2000 seat house. Um, I didn't understand a word because it was Shakespeare. I never heard Shakespeare before. So I learned my first lesson as a director from Adrian Hall. Oh, I, would, I didn't meet him until many years later, but he taught me this direction, this, this lesson, which I'm still working on, which is never talk down to your audience. He could have done this kid's lock. He spoke from the complexity of his and his company's soul to us, these 15 year old kids, or I was 15. And at that moment, I had to take everything I had experienced in my 15 years and meet the stage because I didn't understand it. I had to actually go outside of myself to meet this event, which, I, which was incomprehensible to me. And yet I sat at the end of the theater, at the end of the production and I said, this is what I'm <coughs> this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. This is it. Whatever this is, that's it. And that's and you also a director. in your sense of the theater, which draws on such deep traditions of the theater is magic and the theater is myth. You also speak of an alchemical process where the feelings if I understand you, the feelings of rage and frustration you felt as an adolescent yeah. were transmuted into something else. That's beautiful. Something that you yeah. yes. eventually would yeah. talk, could talk about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly as you describe it. Alchemical <laughs> yeah. transformation. But then after you do graduate from this high school, eventually you graduate from college. <laughs> After it took me four you, colleges, I took, it took me four <laughs> colleges. Yes, you sir. are a lesson to all of the students I talk to who say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. I will say, look at the career of one of the most important global figures in theater, 
And she took her four colleges before she finally graduated from Bard and came to New York, a very different New York in 1974. Would you mind, because it was there in New York that Anne Bogart became Anne Bogart. Would you, <laughs> there are two, you did two very early productions. I would, could you tell us the, quick, the story of these two early productions? One, a scandal, and one, a cult production, where Anne Bogart became Anne Bogart. The first was called In Habitat, was it not? And I don't think anybody will recognize that name except students of your career. And the second, a rather more common name, the production of South Pacific. Pacific. What happened? What were these productions? <laughs> yeah. As Anne Bogart became Anne Bogart. Well, I had a, a um, teacher in, in at Bard, Roberta, <coughs> excuse me, Roberta Sklar, who was um, who worked with the Open Theater. And she said to me when I graduated, she said, "Okay, go to New York, get a company, and start making plays." That's what she said. Oh, she said, go to New York, get a writer and a company and start making plays. So I went. Okay. And um, and I said, um, I, I got jobs. I had all kinds of crazy jobs that included, you know, collections departments in water, you know, in water companies. And uh, I worked on Wall Street. I worked in after school programs. I worked in um, uh, on Wall Street. Then. What's that? Were you a budding, a budding analyst for Goldman Sachs? Not I'm Goldman Wall Sachs. It's, it was um, Han, Hanley and Hanley. It doesn't exist anymore. It went Chapter Eleven after I left. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it was a, it was a big company, and the reason I was hired was to look into accounts payable because the way that people were selling stocks had changed a great deal. It wasn't being done on the. Um, on the golf courses anymore, it was being done differently. And so I was asked to actually uh, combust all the people who were spending thousands of dollars in hotels on cigars and things. Anyway, that's a that's a completely different story. Anyway, I had a <laughs> lot of jobs and I asked her and I said, how do you find actors? And they said, well, when you put an ad in backstage, this magazine backstage, and um, so I put an ad and it said, um, I was looking for actors, a little tiny ad, looking for actors who are interested in assassination, looking at investigation of assassination and murder using Shakespeare's Macbeth. Macbeth really stuck with me when I was young. So, and so I started getting calls. Anyway, uh, I learned the, um, I learned about the Pandora's box that is an actor's life in New York because I, I, I neglected to say there was no money and the phone started ringing and I and uh, half of them hung up when I said, oh, by the way, I don't have any money, but half of them wanted to audition. And I'll, I'll never forget, I, 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 I was living in a loft at the time on Grand Street, which cost $325 a month. There were three of us living there. It had a living room, a dining room, a kitchen and a dance studio and no heat on Grand between Broome and Broadway, uh, not between Broome and Broadway, between uh, 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 between Broadway and the next one over, whatever it is. Uh, Bowery? Uh, hmm? Bowery? No, no, uh, I'll remember. Oh, well, it, it was downtown. It was Crosby, Crosby, between mm -hmm. Broadway and Crosby. Um, and uh, and and so I did. I was so nervous as a director to meet these actors. I decided to do interviews. So I set up a table in the dance studio, and people would come one at a time, and I would interview them. And I'll never forget this one guy comes in. He's twice my age. He shows me his CV. It's got Broadway, off Broadway, TV, film, t everything. And he, his breath smelled a little like alcohol. And he burst into tears and he said, I just want to do something that means something. And from that moment on, I understood what an actor's life is in New York, you know, what it means. I did a bunch of shows downtown. I kept going to theaters and seeing if I could get hired to do something, but they'd look at my silly college resume and laugh at me. Um, I did a number of shows sort of down in lofts and stuff. And finally, I went to theater for the new city 
uh, not to be confused with Theater for a New Audience. Theater for a New City, which was run then by um, Crystal Field and George Bartegna. I was maybe 22, 23 years old. And George, <coughs> who was then married to Crystal Field said, oh yeah, uh, we have a prop room, which, which Crystal's thinking of emptying out. So you can use the prop room as a theater and you can do a play there. So I went back to the actors I was working with on this show and I said, oh my God, we have a real New York theater. No more sort of on the street sort of thing. We're gonna be in a real theater in New York. And so we started rehearsing. Dee Dee O'Connell was in the show. Um, the, the, in, the fantastic Dee Dee O'Connell. We were all like kids. And uh, we rehearsed in, in uh, I was, by that time I was living in a, in a house in Brooklyn. It was a three-story house, which was also exactly $325 a month. And I was sharing it with um, David Schechter, a friend of mine who was in Runaways, Liz Suedos' Runaways. He was acting in it. And we shared this house that had three floors. Anyway, I was so excited. We were doing a real show in a real theater. I went back a week before we were supposed to open. And George Bartanyov saw me coming. God rest his soul. He died recently. He saw me coming and he got a guilty look on his face. I could see it. And he said, oh, uh, Crystal has decided not to turn the prop room into a theater, so you're out of luck. I don't have anywhere for you to perform. I went back, told the four actors. One of them was so disappointed they quit. Three stayed, including Dee O'Connell, and um, who just won a Tony last year for her, 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 uh, her performance um, on Broadway. Uh, and uh, I went back to them and I said, I'm so sorry, we've lost a theater. My roommate, David Schechter, kept saying, well, why don't you do the play in our house? I said, nobody, this was before Brooklyn was hip. This is when Brooklyn was really unhip. And I kept saying, nobody's gonna wanna go to Brooklyn. Uh, I, we can't do a show in the house. I want a theater, I want a real theater. And uh, <clears throat> so I had no other choice. And I had a friend who had a truck and she <laughs> said she would pick up audiences every day, every night and carry them over to Brooklyn from New York. You I, pick, pick, didn't you pick up the audiences 100 yards from where I'm sitting now on I the did. corner of 3rd Street and LaGuardia? Exactly. It was a restaurant right there on 3rd Street and LaGuardia. And <laughs> small world. And I put this little ad in the Village Voice and said, if you want to see this house, and I changed the title because it's in our house to Inhabitat. The text was a mixture of like a little Irene Fournaise, a little uh, Harold Pinter, a little bit of Beckett, like spread throughout. And we staged it in all the, the rooms of the house. This is before it's such a thing as site specific. And so my friend said she would take audiences. We, she could take 37 people a night, that was it. And they would come to the third in LaGuardia, they would get into this truck with no windows and they would go be taken across the Brooklyn Bridge to Fort Greene Place where, that, where our three-story house was. They'd get out of the truck and there was Dee Dee O'Connell standing at the top of the steps to the Brownstone with two bags of groceries and a puff coat. And she would give the first monologue from the top of the steps. The audience would go in and they would go to all the different rooms. They could go in any order they wanted. And then the final scene was take place in the big kitchen and they all gathered to watch the final scene. So this became a little cult hit, this production. And John Cage came one night and uh, he loved it so much that he told all his friends and he actually named the street of his favorite uh, uh, ear inn where he used to go every night. He called it D.D. O'Connell Street. And so he didn't actually come in the, in the truck. I think he got taken there separately. And, uh, <laughs> and it became this cold hit. But John Cage said to his friends, oh, the sound of the dogs barking outside, mixing with the sound of the scenes inside. And I'm thinking... I don't really care about that. I want a real theater. I'd like a real. I don't want to be doing a theater in my house. But and you, I think you're given insufficient credit for being one of the inventors of what is now called immersive theater. <laughs> yeah. But what of South Pacific? A very different, um, a very yeah. different experience. Well, okay, because I was doing all these shows downtown in street, on in shop windows and everything. I got hired by ETW, Ron Argelander, who began ETW, which is the Experimental Theater Wing at NYU. I got hired to teach, which is ironic because 
I had tried to get a job in a whole, I did, never thought I'd get a job in New York. So I applied because I had gone to NYU and got an MA in a, what was then a two year program and is now called performance studies, which is a fantastic program. Um, I, I had applied to schools all over the country thinking I'll never get hired in New York. So I'll live somewhere else. And then Ron Argelander said, would you teach at ETW? And I was like, oh my God, what will I teach? He said, well, I've been seeing your shows downtown for a couple of years, just do whatever it is. So I started doing shows with NYU students. And then I got obsessed with the idea of doing a musical in specific South Pacific, mostly because my father was in the South Pacific, my grandfather was in the South Pacific during the war and I loved the music. And so we got the rights for it. Uh, so it was- Amazing, we, amazing. Well, we got them also taken away from us, but that's another story. Um, so so uh, the, the issue was doing a musical with um, with young, young undergraduate students. How do you do this play? And working with the then music director, Jeffrey Halpern, we came up with an, uh, an approach, which is it was 1984. And at that time, there were these wars happening in Beirut and Grenada. And we said, what would happen <coughs> if there was a... Um, if there was a, a, a sort of institute where people who had war debt were war damaged from Beirut and Granada would go to reintegrate into American society. And what would happen if as a graduation ceremony, they were to perform South Pacific? And what would happen if they were required to play roles that, would, that, that dealt with their trauma? So for example, if I had been in a trench as a guy and lost my best friend, another guy, I would be si assigned to Ain't Nothing Like a Dane because it's a song about male bonding so that I would have to actually deal with my trauma. So I looked at the contract with the Rodgers and Hammerstein um, contract every day to make sure we didn't break any rules. And it didn't say that, uh, that, that there couldn't be eight Nellie Forbushes or four and Neil de Becks, you know, no, nowhere said that. We did it in order. The only thing that went out of order was that as you came into the theater, which was the downstairs theater at, uh, that had just been, was being renovated by uh, the grace of the Tisch brothers who gave $7 million to, to, to renovate that building. Um, uh, 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 as you came in, the set design was a clinic, white clinic with, with plexiglass walls that looked like, um, looked like glass. And as you came in, this is the only thing we did out of order. There was a woman who was standing at a, uh, at a, po a post and she was surrounded by three doctors who were taking notes. And she was singing, this is gonna be hard with my cold. I'll try and do it for you. For 20 minutes, she's saying, <coughs> sorry. She's saying, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love. I'm love in with love, a wonderful I'm love, God. I'm in love, I'm in love. <gasps> She'd take a big breath there. I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love. <coughs> Excuse me. I think you have some water. Do you have some water there? I do, I have all of this stuff. Yeah. Other than that, it was in order. But there were eight Nellie Forbushes and four Emile de Becks and two, uh, two Billises, one male, one female. And this production, is probably the height of my career. I mean, you couldn't get in, lines down the street. We added midnight shows. And the um, Rogers and Hammerstein people, led by Ted Chapin, who I have to end this story by telling you what he said to me about two months ago. Uh, uh, they sent, they were about to do a revival of the production and they sent the director, the family members, the lawyers, they sent them all to see the show. And then when we applied for an extension, because it was so popular, they denied it because they had their own version coming up. It, that production they did opened in LA. It didn't do so well. And um, about a couple of years later, um, I have two endings to the story. There was a, um, at NYU, there was a, Evangel and Morphos put together a, 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 an evening event that was called Authors versus directors. <laughs> and it was packed. And um, and invited was uh, was uh, 
Joanne Ecolitis, who had done um, Beckett stage at ART in the set design of a, a subway, along with the Grove Press people. John Guare was sitting next to me. The, all the people from the uh, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, it was supposed to be about these controversies that happened between directors and authors. Joanne said she was, to, they, we were asked each to speak about the relationship between a director and an author. And Joanne was the first to speak. She crossed her arms. She said, I refuse to speak because I didn't know that this, this was billed as authors versus directors. So she shut up. Various people, oh, and Richard Schechter was in the audience and he kept standing up, his pack. He kept standing up and shouting, the tyranny of the people with the microphones. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and when it came to me to speak, I was still young and this was true. This is not true anymore. Uh, we were supposed to talk about uh, authors and directors. I said, well, I usually work with dead authors. And John Ware sitting next, sitting next to me said, how do you think we get that way? It was hysterical. <laughs> But the reason I'm telling the story is that on the way, I had to escape at the end. Uh, I, I, I tried to escape, the place was packed. It was very controversial. Um, uh, the head of the, um, uh, Ted Chapin, who runs the Hammerstein Foundation came up to me and he said, this was before the, I guess this was shortly after South Pacific. And it was before the revival that they were famously gonna do it, starting in Los Angeles. And he said, Anne, when you see our new production, you'll see many familiar things. And I said, like what? And he started describing things that I had done on that little stage at NYU. Like he said, bare chested soldiers with backlight coming over the hill. He started naming these things. And I thought, this was not even a thought, it was like a split instant. I realized I had a choice in my life. I would either take it personally and litigate, or I'd say, which I decided to do, cool. And I decided that's a better way to live. That production actually didn't have a success. It wasn't until Bart Shear did it uh, a number of years ago at Lincoln Center, a beautiful production. But the end of the story is <coughs> he was sitting behind me, um, uh, the head of the uh, uh, Hammersmith Foundation was sitting behind me at the OB ceremony a couple of months ago. And he leaned forward and he was talking about Oklahoma. And he said, he just said this, he said, thank you for Oklahoma. In other words, they never would have let uh, da Daniel Fish do his version of Oklahoma if we hadn't done our version of South Pacific. But it took many, many years for him to come around to that. And That's a long again, story. No, no, because yet again, what I take from this is one, your respect from voices from the past, all your respect for Indian classical drama, your respect for Greek classical drama, your sense that the past can be a revivified and transformative part of the, of the present. And secondly, you anticipated art as therapy for trauma. Hmm. That hmm. You know, recently, some people, the NEA was interested in in art in in Walter Reed, a military hospital. So you saw the connections, and have seen seems to me throughout your career, the connections between art and trauma, and the audience transform understanding trauma and transforming trauma into another state of awareness i there's so much more but i wondered if you would mind if we come back and we'll talk about what happened in 1982 another inflection point where with suzuki that she that she suzuki you found the cd theater group and can we spend just a couple of minutes in what seemed to me yet another transformative moment in your life. It's 2021, 22, 2020. In 2020, you're sitting in a basement studio in London. You're living with your wife, Rena Vogel, and you sit down and you're thinking about what to do with a company, the idea of collaboration. And then you write this book, the Art of Resonance, which is 
yet again your sense of theater in our time and how we as an audience must participate. We cannot be these passive consumers of spectacle. And the book, the book has many new things. You're always new. They say you're avant-garde, you're always experimental, you love the past and you're experimental at the same time. One of the things that interested me about the book, and maybe we have time to just to do two things and then go to the question. One, you come to term with race. You have a reckoning about, you want to talk about that for a minute. And the second is, what is the art of resonance? Surely it's inseparable from the reckoning with race. So what was the reckoning with race that this book talks about? Well, I'll start with the, the, the second part of your question because it leads to the first part of your question. So I used to, I, I used to think that the job of theater is to remember. And I think of, you take that word and you say re-member, to remember, to put things back together again. And that the job of an artist is to finish sentences for people who have died. Liz Suedos, for example, is to give voice to, to dead people. I know that sounds rather morbid. Um, and then I learned through neuroscience that, that memory is actually a protein in the brain that it's created through emotion. So if you're at a production that <laughs> causes a great deal of emotion, that the heat of that emotion creates a protein in the brain. And then you have to create synaptical activity to reach that protein, to remember, to put that memory back together again. I mean, if you think of productions that you've seen where you leave the theater and you know you've forgotten it already, or what about those experiences where you remember for years that keep coming back and back? So I thought, how fantastic that the theater is about creating a protein, like a real physical thing in the audience's head. And so this notion of theater as to remember was with me until I was in a conversation with my colleague, Leon Inglesrud, whose mother had Alzheimer's. And he said to me, well, what about people who can't remember, who can't form memories? And I really got stopped by that question. Like, what is the role of art or theater for people who can't form memories? And then I remember, and I remembered the fact that I cannot remember what I read last week. I'm a huge reader. Well, when I'm not watching TikTok these days, but I'm a huge reader and I read books that transform me. And then a week later, I can barely remember the name of the book or I can't remember the sentences that so moved me unless I memorize them. And, I, and, and then I, I started thinking, well, actually the act of reading something that transforms me, it's not so important about remembering the data. It's that in the act of reading, something happens. And that something is resonance. And I realized that resonance is even more important than building memory. In other words, the moment of contact with the art is about creating, is, is about, um, setting up the possibility of a resonance happening between the audience and between the actors, for example, in the theater, like what that is. So that book is dedicated very much to, um, to exploring that subject about setting up. Now, um, my favorite quote that I ever read in my whole life was in an interview with Alfred Brendel, who is the great uh, Beethoven pianist, who, um, who said that when he's in concert, he lifts his hand before playing the final chord of a Beethoven sonata and asks silently the audience, this is in concert, lifts his hands and silently asks the audience how long they'll let him wait before he, play, he plays the final chord. And when I read that, I literally screamed. I said, that is the heart of the theater, is what, how audiences allow audi actors to do something, how actors allow audiences to do something. So that was very much the theme of the book. Now I was writing the book at a time of great change, which was happening concurrent to COVID. And it became clear that, um, that race is one of the major issues of our time because 
we have forgotten the crimes of our own past. As Gore Vidal called us the United States of amnesia and actually pulling back the layers that have hidden the pain of issues of race, especially in our country, became imperative. And it's something that I have just been living my whole life personally without actually having empathy for the pain of others caused by the systemic racism of our country. And so my, my answer to that part of your question might be a little bit unsatisfactory, but the idea now of recognizing pain or trauma and finding shapes that show that, that, that can contain some grace within the recognition is the task that lays before us. Thank you. Thank you. There, I, I urge us all, if you love the theater or like the theater, love art, love culture, love our world, love our realities. This is an art that can help take us through because it also shows how we must come to terms with the frailties that we have through not feeling alienated from our world, but resonant with it, no matter how much pain that might cause us because of our own frailties. Do I have that right, Anne? Oh, beautifully said. And, and um, thank you for showing the picture of the book because I'm very proud of that cover. It sort of says it all, the visual of it. So, and I, I'd love to share it with others. So. Um, I'm going to go to chat. And thank you again for doing this one. It's obvious that your that your cold is fighting to remain with you. So here we go. <laughs> here we go. Uh, here. All right. I thank you for this question because it takes up something we weren't able to cover in our time. Or I, I suggested that we go to the Art of Residence. What is the next chapter for CD Company in your archives? And we, you know, it took, us, it took us a long time to decide to quit, uh, to, to close this chapter of CD Company. But after 30 years, I think it's time. Um, we, we talked a lot as a company, whether the, 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 the company goes on diversifies, finds new leadership, new administration. Are we an institute or are we a group of people who got together 30 years ago and expected to last 10 years? And instead we lasted 30. After much discussion, we decided we're a group of people, we're not an institute, and that I didn't want to peter out. I didn't want us to just sort of dance along and peter out. So this decision of putting um, to close our doors is the uh, is also a hope for some kind of uh, renaissance, which is yet to be determined. We have uh, we took a lot a lot of effort both over COVID and then in our final season, which was a season of I think five plays that we did touring new plays <coughs> and, and one at the Skirball Radio Macbeth again Macbeth raises its head. Um, and uh, what the future is, we do not know, but there are archives. There is the potential for company members to use the 501c3 as needed. Uh, it, our alumni um, uh, network is very strong and adamant about staying together. So we'll see. I don't really have an answer, but we'll see. Um, CD, Saratoga, International Theater Institute. I need a question answered here. Why Saratoga? I mean, it's not just because of horse racing there. Well, that's part of it. I'm a horse lover. That's part of it. No, um, uh, when I started the company with Tadashi Suzuki in 1992, it was he had the idea of creating a place of fellowship for theater artists from around the world uh, 
in the United States. His company is in Togamura, which is way up in the mountains of Japan, it takes forever to get there, days to get there. And it's a theater complex in the mountains with rice paddies. And, and it was clear to me when Suzuki proposed this that it would, shouldn't be in New York. And I immediately proposed Saratoga because it was a town I love, not just for the horses, but there's also the spa. It's a healing place. It's a place of the New York City Ballet, the Chicago uh, Orchestra. It's a very cultural place in the foot of the Adirondacks. So we chose it. Now, I didn't know Suzuki's company is called the Suzuki uh, Scott Company, Suzuki Company of Toga. What I didn't know when I chose Saratoga is what he told me after he, we started, he said, it's very easy for him to raise money for Saratoga. I said, why? He said, well, do you know what Saratoga means in Japanese? I said, no. He said, it means the new Toga, Saratoga. His is the Suzuki company of Toga. He said, it's very easy to raise money. He just says Saratoga and people know what he's doing. They hand him money. <laughs> <laughs> but Saratoga is where we spent every June for 30 years. Uh -huh. Here, quick, we're almost at the end, but there are two questions I think you'll love. Actually, three. Did teaching change or influence your approach to making theater? Was it always an important part of your work? You know, I have a student, um, she was actually an acting student at Columbia, and she told me that her father's a doctor, and that have, doctors have a saying, do one, teach one, study one. And when she said that, I screamed. I said, wait a minute, that's my, that's my formula. Do one meaning for me direct, study one meaning do research, teach one meaning teach. That has to be balanced for me. The teaching influences the directing, the directing influences the teaching, the research influences both. If I do too much directing, not enough teaching, I suffer. If I do not enough research, I suffer. I have to keep those three things in balance because they inform one another. So this isn't true for all directors, but for me, that trio, that triad is fundamental to my um, my health as an artist. And your books too. I mean, you wrote a book about directing and your books are, you're very, you're one of our ethicists as well. And your books are also, not teach technical teaching, but let's try to live collaboratively in this way together. Yeah. There are two more questions that we we can't stop unless you give us your wisdom about these two, and then we will have to stop. One is, <laughs> what lessons have stayed with you from the early days of taking audiences in a truck over the river? And the second, Going back to you as a child, what advice do you both have to a 10-year-old child looking for ways to create and participate in helping to offer a mirror to fellow classmates? Hmm. Um, well, that was addressed to both of us. So I'll, tell, I'll answer the first one. You start to answer the second. Um, the first one for me, the biggest, um, what I learned is to be courageous. And I remember uh, uh, Richard Foreman came to talk to my directing students once and somebody asked for advice and he said, be courageous and that's it. He also said, and I found it amazing coming from him being the most, one of the most cerebral direct directors on the planet. He said, directing is 100% intuitive. You know, we think that directing, you have to know what you're doing. It's actually preparing certainly, but being in the moment with what is happening with actors in a room. Um, the other thing I would say is the importance of getting out of your own country, that we are blinded by living in um, the environment we live in and going to see the work of great directors that um, uh, since I'm a directing fanatic, to be in, in, in the hands of a great director is uh, life altering. And I mean that often it's a director with, in re relationship to a company how, how would you answer that second question about the 10 year old thing? To a 10 year old? Yeah. I'm going to say something and then I want you to comment. 
a 10-year-old child, they have cup. Unless it's been beaten out of them, there's a capacity for play. I suppose I would ask the 10-year-old child what he or she or they wants to do, but I would avoid the metaphor of the mirror because if I'm read reading you and following the way in which you do theater, you talk a lot about empathy, it runs through your books, understanding the other, and also collaboration and participation. So to the 10-year-old child, I would say, don't hold up a mirror. Ask your classmates how you can collaborate working in the context and with the content of your times. But I would I would have a lot of trust in 10 year olds. But I want you to have the, I want the last word and it's going to be two words and an exclamation mark. But you have the penultimate words. What would you say? Oh, I, simply uh, everything you said is beautiful. I would just add, don't treat kids like kids. Treat them as fully formed human beings. I think the worst thing you can do is to um, is to restrict their movement and learn from that. We need to learn from them because they're the ones you brought up play. We lose the capacity to play so so swiftly. Celebrate that. Celebrate who they are. I, it goes back to seeing Macbeth at the age of 15 too. Is I didn't understand a word of it, but it was really important. So don't talk down to a 10 year old. And thank you for talking so directly to us, and giving us so much of your, your wisdom and your experience. And to see how much you have anticipated in directions in the theater. And also your passion, this is one than three words, or two words with an exclamation mark, but your passion for presence. You know, it's ironic that we're doing a webinar and we're being digital. I said to you, Catherine, let's do it in person, remember? I said that and I said, we're working on it and we will work on it. So I will say to the Skirball Center that sponsors us, let's try to do this again with Anne, maybe some Let's try to do it. Let's try to sit on a stage. Let's try to not be pixelated, but passionate in the moment. And now the two words I was going to say with an exclamation mark. Thank you. You deserve all the acclaim you get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And feel better. Just thank feel you. better, please. And thank you for thank doing you, this in the midst of a viral invasion. Yeah. Okay. And thank you to everybody for coming. We will start up again in the fall. Watch what's coming. But Anne, thank you again for taking us through the springtime. My pleasure. Thank you, Catherine. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for being here. Skirball Tapes signing off for the spring 2023 season with the brilliant, always prophetic, Anne Bogart. <laughs>